Biography of Maximin Giraud, Shepherd of La Salette, 1855-1875, by Father Alfred Perrin, Apostolic Missionary in Nantes, France, 1913. The preface is entitled, The Abbreviated Version of Maximin Self-Portrait, and begins with the quotation, God chose what is weak in the world to confound the strong. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. The apparition of the Mother of God at La Salette on September 19, 1846, is without doubt the most important manifestation of the Blessed Virgin in all the centuries, because of her teachings and revelations concerning the end of the world. Without any exaggeration, we can say that La Salette is the Gospel and the Apocalypse of Mary. Without doubt, the Gospel is independent of the moral and intellectual value of the person who preaches it. Nevertheless, the world is unanimous in recognizing that it needs, or at least is happy to have apostles worthy of God. The Eternal Logos understood so well that a certain success of the Word of God is linked to the virtue of the one who preaches it, that he himself formulated this sentence concerning ministers unworthy of their divine mission, quote, Do what they tell you, but do not do what they do. Matthew chapter 23, verse 3. In consequence of this Gospel text, it is the general rule of providence to accept for its mystical revelations only seers of good character. They are, if not saints deserving of canonization, at least respectable characters worthy of faith and consideration from the simple human point of view. Such is the case with the two messengers of Our Lady of La Salette, Melanie and Maximin. Nowadays, through various printed documents, reparation of honor has been made to the memory of the Holy Shepherdess of the Alps. Alas, this is not yet the case with her worthy companion, Maximin Giraud. And yet, he has the right to a beautiful page in the history of the Church. His life was published in a work from 1881, which is unfortunately ignored or disdained in the official literature of La Salette. It is the detailed account of his life, how shall I say, his panegyric. What is this important volume? Here is the title, Triomphe de Notre Dame de la Salette dans l'un des témoins de son apparition, Maximin peint par lui-même. Translated, Triumph of Our Lady of La Salette and one of the witnesses of her apparition. Maximin Self-Portrait. This double title of the book has the disadvantage by today's standards of being a bit long. It would be better to write Biographie de Bergère de La Salette, Biography of the Shepherd of La Salette. Moreover, this work has two other defects. The first is that the author wanted to remain anonymous. One cannot write history by hiding. How can this fault of the writer be explained? It is because he was a priest. Unfortunately, because of certain formalities or administrative difficulties, the clergy in general do not enjoy the necessary independence if they wish to write the history of the Church in a complete and impartial way. It is sad to say, but it must be said. It is so true that a Catholic publisher has not been afraid to write these words, alas, often true, quote, in our time, the Church is an organization of pious deception." Unquote. That is why I was asked to authenticate Maximum's life with my signature, which is well known in high places, because I am qualified to do so, having known Melanie of La Salette personally. Now, and this is all there is to this affair, I can affirm before God and man that the shepherdess told me in September 1901 that she greatly appreciated the book. Maximum Self-Portrait. She had received a copy as homage of the author himself as soon as it appeared, and she had kept it. However, having lost this precious book on one of her last journeys from Italy to France, where her trunks were abandoned in transit and even robbed, she begged one of her friends to obtain for her another copy. She even wrote on this subject on October 10, 1901, 
of her contentment at finally having in her hands this book which gave her so much delight in placing before her eyes her dear and pious companion whom she had never ceased to esteem and love. It would therefore be desirable, in spite of the expense that would result, that the original volume be reprinted with certain alterations, not for the substance, but for the form. But here is its second effect. Although written with conviction, enthusiasm, and especially historical accuracy, this work is too voluminous for the common reader. It contains 620 pages of fine print in a compact layout. Although divided into rather clear chapters, it is too diffuse in the ideas presented by an excess of documents, letters of maximum, and his correspondence mixed together with the historical account. Is it not the case to say with Beaulieu que ne se ne se borne ne se jamais écrire? Can one who fails to restrain himself ever write? Finally, this volume, the best biography of Maximin, is impossible to find. Its author, Father Bailiff, did not offer it for sale through a large bookstore trade. He had it printed in Nimes by Clavel Bellevet A.C. It was sold for four francs by a pious publisher of Nimes, Mr. Adrien Paladin, known for his Analyse du Supernatural. About ten years after the publication of Father Le Bailiff's book, his agent died. The widowed Mrs. Paladin, overburdened with her husband's unsold pamphlets, advertised Maximum's biography for two and a half francs in a small leaflet which was poorly distributed. In this manner, the entire mystical legacy fell into oblivion and finally ended up under the auctioneer's gavel. In such circumstances, my conscience makes it imperative a duty to resurrect the work of Father Le Bailiff by abbreviating it. I will add only a few unpublished details and I will avoid making reflections for fear of making this biography too long. Maximum, the worthy witness of the most instructive event in the religious and mystical history of the 19th century, must not be forgotten. As an illustration, in 1866 there were about 1,200 shrines erected in France and abroad in honour of Our Lady of La Salette. In the millions of engravings and pictures, we see the little shepherd standing before the Virgin, recommending that her instructions be passed on to all her people, yet we don't know his story. His biography, therefore, has a right to a place in the annals of Pellerin de Marie, Mary's Pilgrim, a Marian review devoted especially to the study of Revelations of La Salette. It is all the more necessary since Maximum is generally discredited and slandered because he is not known. How can he finally be made known? First of all, I will outline the stages of his life in a few pages. Secondly, I will show as frankly and briefly as possible the soul of this worthy chosen one of Mary in various vignettes which will be like facets of his moral physiognomy. Finally, by bringing together these various portrayals, we will have the abbreviated but satisfactory biography of this good man who never ceased to be a true Christian, a seer who was obviously inspired by God in the defense of La Salette and even a great character. Melanie's emulator deserves, like her, to pass to posterity even if, as it is profitable, the Vatican would fail to deliver to the Church the famous secret which it received from him officially on July 18, 1851. Introduction Outline of a Holy Life Maximum Giraud was born in Cor, Isère, on August 27, 1835, and died there on March 1, 1875. Between these two dates, his life passed in the following manner. He lost his mother at an early age and was brought up by a stepmother who was kind to him. As for his father, a wheelwright at Cor, who had no religious practices and was in the habit of blasphemy, like so many workmen, he sent him neither to school nor to catechism class. 
He even left his son on the street, occupied mainly with collecting dung. Maximin was a shepherd only momentarily and temporarily, just eight days before the famous apparition of the Alps. His father had merely offered him to one of his friends to replace a sick shepherd. Such was the abandoned child that Our Lady of La Salette judged it appropriate to choose to be her tireless missionary for 30 years. The day after the apparition, Maximum returned to his father's house, where he stayed only a few weeks, busy telling everyone about the heavenly vision of September 19th. Then the religious authorities began to take care of him, and with the consent of his parents, who readily gave him up, placed him with the Sisters of Providence in Cor, with a view to instructing him and preparing him for his first communion. He made it with great faith and edification on May 7, 1848. The nuns took maternal care of him for about four years. Their great concern was to discern his vocation, and to this end, in the autumn of 1850, they took Maximum to see the Holy Cure of ours, in the hope that he would show him the path he should follow in his life. This pilgrimage gave rise to what is known as the Ars Incident, an event which caused much misunderstanding between the Holy Priest and the Shepherd of La Salette. It was commented on in various ways by the many historians of the fact of La Salette. We find it particularly in the first edition of The Life of the Blessed, published in 1864, under the pen of the two apparitions, early historian Father, Max, Mo, Father Monin. It can now be summed up in two words. On the one hand, the good priest was not a competent judge in this case, and on the other, there was at play the work of the devil. In any case, the man of God gave no direction to the child and left him free in his, in his choice of life. And so perhaps, unbeknownst to him, Blessed VNA had a wonderful role in the designs of providence for the messenger, the apostle of Our Lady of La Salette, who was destined to travel a great deal in order to spread the great news. On Maximum's return from Ars, a protector who was at the same time the first historian of the apparition, the good canon Bez from Evreux, placed him in the College of Eculi near Lyon, directed by the Marist Fathers. He wanted to remove him from the annoyance of the perpetual visitors who inevitably disturbed his studies, and he gave him the name Joseph Bay. No sooner had he been installed there and already settled than the Bishop of Grenoble, the pious Bishop de Briard, asked for him to enter his own minor seminary at Rondeau, not far from his Episcopal city, Grenoble, where Maximum spent only two years. In the year 1852, the Bishop, realizing that the student could not make any progress in his studies because of the many visitors who wanted to see him, sent him eight leagues from Grenoble to the minor seminary of La Côte Saint André. There, as at Rondeau, he was still plagued by curiosity seekers from all the upper classes of society, and even by pious women who were nothing less than religious fanatics. Maximum, orphaned in 1849, was entrusted by the bishop to the deepest solitude. He placed him under the direction of a truly distinguished guardian and teacher, Father Champon, parish priest of Saint-Saëns, a league from Grenoble. From the human point of view, these were Maximum's three best years, 1853 to 1856, under such a teacher, he made rapid progress in Christian perfection and in science. Straight away, he was learned enough to do his spiritual reading in Latin, either the imitation of Christ or the Bible, even sometimes in Greek or in Hebrew itself, or finally in Italian, in the Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus Liguori. In March 1856, he let himself be directed to the major seminary of Dao. Although wanting to remain incognito, he was soon discovered there on the occasion of a church consecration ceremony where they placed on him the bishop's mitre. 
From that day on, he was celebrated everywhere, surrounded by the attention, friendship, and esteem, which, to tell the truth, he was worthy of because of his sincere piety, his good spirit, and his good manners. The future smiled upon him, and everything invited him to enter the ranks of the clergy, where all his best friends and those who were interested in him wanted him so much, especially the Diocese of Grenoble. But, heroically, Maximum refused to receive the tonsure at the ordination of Trinity Sunday in 1858, in spite of all the solicitations, because entry into the clergy was not ratified in his conscience. He did not feel called by God to the priesthood, and he refused to be a priest, regardless of personal vice or virtue. Moreover, he was very keen on his independence, wanting to fulfill what he never ceased to claim as his mission to pass on to all the people the revelation and the teachings of the Weeping Virgin of September 19th, 1846. The world, even the religious world, did not understand this mission, nor the independence necessary for the publication of the truth. His many benefactors and friends, under various pretexts, moved away from him, when they saw him set aside the cassock of a seminarian after two years. For a few weeks, he was reduced to a state of abject poverty. Finally, thanks to the protection of Mr. Corneau, ex-prefect of the Department of Lands and the Secretary General of the Ministry of the Interior, he obtained a job at the Hospice of Vesenet at a rate of 1,500 francs per year. It was an unexpected fortune for the Shepherd of the Alps, but on January 10, 1860, he was unjustly dismissed because visitors revealed to the, his unchristian entourage that he was the favorite, the chosen herald of Our Lady of La Salette. Mr. Corneau was powerless to stop the storm that formed over the seer's head. He had left the seminary because he refused to disclose the secret. He could only obtain for maximum, after ten months of good service, an allowance of a few hundred francs. The unfortunate, disgraced young man took advantage of this to go and finish his studies at the College of Tournaire, where he studied for a whole year with the aim of obtaining the diploma, then uncommon, of bachelor. He never succeeded. Disappointed, he returned to Paris in 1862 to seek a livelihood. Overtaken by a serious illness, he had to enter St. Louis Hospital. There, he conceived the idea of becoming a doctor in order to do good to souls. From 1862 to 1865, he was a medical student, but he hid his name and his origin out of caution from the memory of the storm at Le Vecinet. During his medical studies, for which he was very keen, he stayed with Mr. and Mrs. Jourdain of the parish of St. Mary, St. Meredic, 8th century abbot, wealthy merchants who as early as 1861 had begun to adopt him as their son. From the first months, because of his virtue, Maximum suffered persecution for libertine and impious students, but he became a veritable, veritable storm when he was discovered by a formal pupil of the seminary of Grenoble, who recognized him and announced him in these terms, here is my last salette. In spite of his ordeal, Mary's child wanted to pursue his medical career. However, the good doctor Portalis, who had learned to esteem him when treating him during a serious illness in 1863, turned him away from medicine with these reflections. The impious and disruptive press will ruin your credibility as a physician by asking you to cure all your patients miraculously and by blaming your failures on the Blessed Virgin. Maximum understood this himself and fell into a cruel discouragement. In the meantime, the Marquis de Pigernol provided him with a diversion from his sorrows by a trip to Rome in 1865. This trip had an unforeseen result for him, his entry into the Pontifical Zouave. On April 25, 1865, he signed with faith 
and ardor a six-month commitment with the firm intention of renewing it at the hour of danger for the pontiff king. This voluntary enlistment in the first company brought him great joy among his friends and won him new and noble friendships in Rome. But soon Father Bliard, the first author in 1872 of a pamphlet on the secret of Melanie and a close friend of the Jardin couple, urged him to return to France to console his adopted parents to whom he owed everything after God for his future. He returned to them out of gratitude and lived with them in their villa at Petit Joet en Josa, near Versailles, which they ceded to him during their lifetime. This was a misfortune for the shepherd of La Salette. God allowed it to happen in order to humiliate him and to display the virtue of his benefactors, who never ceased to esteem and love him in spite of his follies as manager and owner. Lacking in business knowledge and badly advised, Maximum spent a lot of money restoring this villa. However beautiful the craftsmanship, in less than four years he financially ruined himself and also the old Jordan couple, despite the aid of 10,000 francs from a Spanish benefactor. What a fault in a seer of great renown and in a man whom poverty should have made more frugal. God, whose designs are inscrutable, wanted to teach us the difference we must make between the private man and the messenger of Mary, whose mission is not diminished by these regrettable facts. Under the weight of misfortune and sorrow, Maximum returned to Corps in 1869. Having brought along his adoptive parents, they thus escaped the horrors of the Prussian invasion of 1870, which totally destroyed their villa. Seeking a livelihood for them more than for himself, Maximum engaged in a liquor business at La Salette. He allowed himself to be so deeply exploited by a man named Vivier of Vrairon that he had to resort to the civil courts to save his honor and terminate a commercial contract. Human justice ruled in favor of his good faith and integrity, but it did not restore his fortune. Disease ravaged his health, and he died almost of misery under the helpless eyes of the Jardin couple. They assisted him until his death, and it was holy. Such is, in broad outline, the career of this servant of Mary, whose name will never perish in the church. I even believe that it will grow as the secret of Melanie continues to prove itself in events. While waiting for more glory on earth for this chosen one of heaven, let us get to know his beautiful soul in the Vignettis, which will unfold under these different titles. Maximin, witness of the apparition, apostle of the apparition, guardian of his secret, tested and proven, honorable. He himself will teach us by his example to love Our Lady of La Salette more and more. Mary, the Virgin of the Alps, Bless my pen so that I may analyze well the remarkable and conscientious work of Father Emile Le Bailiff, whose first title is so true, Triomphe de Notre Dame de la Salette dans le de ses témoins, Triumph of Our Lady of la Salette in one of her witnesses. Yes, Maximum does honor to the cause of la Salette, and never ceased by his pure life to be truly worthy to have been chosen by this great queen who is called the Throne de la Sagesse, Seat of Wisdom.